the organizing paradigm of the North Korean economy really goes hand in hand with the structure of its political system and its legitimizing ideology. In this video, I'm going to discuss how this organizing paradigm has evolved over time through periods of consciously remaking North Korean society to periods of chaos and desperately trying to muddle through from disaster to golden age and back to disaster again. So as we go through this journey, pay attention to the recurring themes that come up from previous videos. All of this adds layers of detail to the larger story. There's a lot of ground to cover in this video. I'll explore central planning and the command economy, land reform and collectivization, ideological mobilization of labor, structural problems of the command system, famine and economic collapse, the marketization of the North Korean economy, the rise of the Donju North Korean middle class, the Byungjin line and economic reforms, and current challenges to the North Korean economy. North Korea's economic system, like its political institutions, was inspired by the Marxist-Leninist model imported from the Soviet Union. And this model was a command economy model. Now, command economy is based on central planning. Central planning is a monumental process of bureaucratic coordination that aims to coordinate all the processes, all the functions and all the inputs of the national economy. And this is done by compiling five year plans. Now, as we saw in the video on North Korea's political system, it's the cabinet and its constituent ministries that oversee this central planning process. So let's deconstruct this process. Now I find that diagramming complex processes is a good way to get my head around how they work. So that's what I've done here on the slide, but let's talk it through. So in the central planning process, each five year plan contains millions of individual planning commands. So that's an extraordinary level of complexity these individual planning commands include what's to be produced, in what quantity, and at what price. And it also includes directives about labor and resource allocations. Now, in theory, the government bureaucracy calculates the necessary requirements for efficient economic production. It's meant to be a scientific rational process. To do this, it requires timely and accurate information from every actor in the economy, right down to the individual state-owned firms, which are at the bottom of this pyramid. This information then funnels up the bureaucratic tree to the cabinet and the central government. Then plan targets are issued from the top and filter back down again in the form of production quotas. Thousands of party officials, state administrators, enterprise managers, and mass organizations are all involved in this planning process. So it's, a, it's an enormously complex bureaucratic task. And this command system is cumbersome. Now to cope with this, it's too complex for the cabinet, the central bureaucracy in the cabinet to micromanage every transaction and interaction across the entire economy. So what is what they do is they develop a very broad national plan, which is then divided into smaller sub plans that they give one sub plan to each of the ministries. Each of the ministries then divides their plan up into a series of further sub plans for their provincial offices. And then the provincial officers do the same thing again for the individual state owned firms that are under their jurisdiction in each province. At the bottom of this planning chain, this results in a compulsory annual plan for each firm that contains several thousand commands. So just take a moment to get your head around just how complicated that central planning process is. It's often overlooked nowadays that the command system was seen as a legitimate alternative to capitalism in the 1950s and 1960s. Communist bloc countries around the world were, were recording strong economic growth through this period, largely driven by development of heavy industries like steelmaking and mining. 
So it's not surprising that this period is also considered the golden age of the North Korean economy. So why was it a golden age for North Korea? Well, this is the post-Korean War reconstruction period. So we're seeing rapid economic growth through this time because the economy is being rebuilt from a low base after the war. North Korea's gross industrial production grew at an average rate of 42% during the 1954-1956 three-year plan. So that first plan they issued was a three-year plan, but from there it was five-year plans. And so in the, ne the next five-year plan from 1957 to 61 saw a 37% growth rate. And these growth rates were possible because central planning is actually very good at mobilizing labor and resources for infrastructure construction and heavy industry. And that's the kind of that's the kind of economic activity that was really required to rebuild the country that was flattened during the Korean War. So in the bigger picture of the central planning system, the factories that are shown in these photos are some of the individual state-owned firms uh, that are referred to at the very bottom of that planning hierarchy. So refer back to that pyramid I just showed you. So at the top, we've got a steel mill in Chongjin, and Chongjin is North Korea's third largest city, and it's known as the city of iron because it was so important in North Korea's steel industry, particularly at that time. The bottom picture illustrates is two images from a fertilizer plant in Hamhung. And again, Hamhung, a city on the East Coast, another industrial city that had a lot of uh, assistance in getting set up from allies in East Germany. The Soviet-style command economy system that was established in North Korea also had a mechanical approach to agriculture. And how this agricultural model was implemented in the DPRK followed a similar pattern to that seen in other communist countries. So this is the story. In 1946, so this is at the beginning of the pre-Korean War period, immediately after liberation, Kim Il-sung introduced agricultural reforms which redistributed land to peasant farmers and eliminated the landlords as a political class. So the newly formed Workers' Party of Korea won the support of the peasantry by promising land redistribution. And not surprisingly, this rallied the peasantry to Kim Il-sung's banner, particularly in the north, in the northern, the Soviet occupation zone of Korea at that time. With the Japanese landholders gone, the remaining pre-1945 landlord class was dispossessed of land, which was then redistributed to the peasant farmers who'd worked that land as feudal slaves, but could now own it as smallholder farmers. It's important to note that land redistribution of this kind was critical to cementing the popular support for the newly implemented communist system in Soviet-occupied Korea between 1945 and 1950. And it also satisfied the desires of the peasant class for more autonomy over their livelihoods and more autonomy over their economic circumstances. The second phase of the command system approach to agriculture was called collectivization, which in effect reversed the redistributions of land to the peasants from a decade earlier. Collectivization in the DPRK began in 1954, so this is just after the Korean War, at a time when Kim Il-sung's political position was more secure than it was in 1945. The land that was redistributed to the peasants during the late 1940s was organized into individual smallholder farms. But through collectivization, the DPRK state forcibly transferred those small farms from the peasants into large collective farms. So they consolidated these small farms into these larger, larger farming units that were run by the state. Now, collectivization was highly ideological. It transformed privately owned farms into a version of a state owned factory where farmers who previously produced food for themselves and a bit of surplus for sale were essentially turned into employees who produced food for distribution by the state. Now, I've got some family history with collectivization myself. 
My grandmother grew up as a peasant farm girl in Ukraine in the 1920s and 30s, and she used to tell me stories about the day when the Soviet troops came to her village and took over her family's small farm, and taking their crops and forcing them to work their land as part of a new collective farm. So this was the model that was pioneered by the Soviets in the 1930s and was exported to other communist countries around the world, including North Korea. On the face of it, it would seem politically risky for Kim Il-sung to so quickly backtrack on the initial program of land redistribution to the peasantry. So why did the DPRK embark on its program of collectivization of agriculture? Well, there were three primary reasons that undergirded the push for collectivization. First, it was to increase agricultural productivity according to the principle of economies of scale. And this was part of a broader effort to reconstruct rural villages that were decimated by the Korean War. So two things are going on here. First, the country has an obvious need for food insecurity uh, after the chaos of the war, but also the political circumstances of the regime had changed and Kim Il-sung had cemented his power. Now, the second main reason for collectivization was that Collectivization was a conscious program to bolster the bureaucratic power of the state and incorporate agriculture into the central planning system. So this was more easily done if farms could be organized in the same way that industry was along proletarian lines. The third and related reason for collectivization was ideological was to eliminate private property and to prevent the, pre the peasants from developing bourgeois class sympathies because they were landholders. So by 1957, almost 96% of the peasantry had been incorporated into the agricultural cooperatives as a proletarianized workforce. Almost all produce from the collective farms was given to the state which was then distributed to the population at large as a ration through a body called the public distribution system. The laborers on the collective farms saw no direct benefit from their labor. And this was a significant change in circumstances for the peasants who'd previously been given small farms during the initial late 1940s land redistribution. Let's consider the ideological dimension of collectivization in a bit more detail for a moment. Peasant farming based on private property was just not ideologically palatable for the DPRK government because it was incompatible with centralized political control. As landowners, the peasants represented an independent social, political and economic force with their own petty bourgeois self-interest, as Kim Jong-il once put it. So collectivization not only turned the peasantry into good proletarians, but it also brought them into line with other sections of the population in their dependence on the state. So this mural on the slide depicts Kim Il-sung giving on-the-spot guidance to farmers at a collective farm near Sariwon. On-the-spot guidance, as I mentioned in my video on ideology in North Korea, is a manifestation of the Kim Il-sung cult of personality. And murals like these can be found all over the countryside in the DPRK, and they're a reminder of the centralized control of the state over agriculture. The central planning system of North Korea's command economy was plagued by many structural problems, which led to its eventual collapse in the 1990s. But to understand these structural problems, let's first start with how workers were organized in this system. In any economic system, particularly after the Industrial Revolution, labor productivity is always an issue. If you're a worker, what are your incentives to work hard? So this is a question that's occupied the minds of economic planners in Pyongyang, as well as people in the HR departments of capitalist firms worldwide. All economic systems have some balance of incentives for workers to be productive and punishments for their lack of productivity. 
And that applies to North Korea, the US, Australia, Europe, wherever. But in North Korea's command economy, the incentives for workers are largely ideological, though the punishments are quite material. So what are the incentives? Well, there's large scale ideological mobilization campaigns that are run regularly to increase the productivity of its proletarianized workforce. These ideological mobilization campaigns are called speed battles. And the purpose of speed battles is to boost worker productivity by recreating the military style mobilization and the battlefield fervor of the revolution in the workplace. And the incentive is for the workers to emulate the revolutionary generation that helped forge the DPRK and to honor them as good proletarians by continually working harder to advance the revolution. And this is where the officially designated external enemies of the state, so thinking here of the United States, this is where they come into play because the workers' sacrifice is necessary to help defend the DPRK from these external threats that would otherwise destroy the country. So if we look at the images on the slide here, particularly look at the picture on the top right, which is of Cholima, the mythical flying horse. And Cholima was also the name of the original speed battle mobilization campaign from the 1960s. Let's get to the punitive aspect of the mobilization of labor. So workers in individual state-owned firms and on the collective farms are usually organized into work teams of five to 30 individuals. Under the central plan, each work team has a defined production target or a quota. So teams are punished for not fulfilling those targets. And that could include anything from self-criticism to a spell of re-education in a prison camp. So these work teams, they're a part of the web of coercion of the state. And as I mentioned in my video on North Korea's political system, the Workers' Party of Korea has members embedded into each work team and who report directly to the party on their peers. Work teams also conduct regular self-criticism rituals, the so-called struggle sessions. And these create an atmosphere that pits workers against each other. So this atmosphere, this creates incentives for individual workers to rat each other out if they're not pulling their weight. But more importantly, it consciously reduces the possibility that the members of work teams will organize together collectively in opposition to the state. So it becomes pretty clear then that the workplace is the primary site of political education for North Korean people. And that ideological mobilization within the workplace is part of the North Korean nationalist project. Workers are urged to demonstrate the superiority of the North Korean system over South Korea and the West by beating them in economic competition. That's the ideological incentive. This competition is also couched in the rhetoric of technology and progress as the fruits of the revolution and that the government is driving that progress. And through all this, it's intended to cultivate the individual workers' emotional attachment to the state. So let's bring our attention back to the central planning process. And the problem for the economic planners in the cabinet was that the ideological incentives for workers quickly lose their appeal and become ineffective. The permanent revolution of continual, frantic mobilization just ends up wearing workers out. This mobilization fatigue, along with the fear of punishment, creates a space for information distortions in the data that's fed up through the central planning process. So this is a really important place where the central planning system comes out of whack. Because of punishments for officials who fail to meet their allocations at each level, implementation of the central plan becomes a process of calculated negotiation and bargaining. It becomes a politicized process of self-interest, not the process based of, on scientific logic that it was envisaged to be by the creators of the command system.
Let's come back to our central planning pyramid diagram. Each level of planning adds another layer of complexity to the plan calculations. And with increased complexity comes greater opportunities for information distortions and errors in the final calculations. So during the planning process, the bureaucrats at each level of the planning pyramid need information from the levels under their jurisdiction below them. Provincial officers get information from individual firms. Ministries get data from the provincial level officers, the cabinet from the ministries, and so on and so forth. Now, in a perfect environment, information flowing back up the chain of command would be accurate, leading to realistic production targets that minimise waste of labour and resources. But there is no perfect operating environment here. In reality, information gets distorted all the way up the planning chain because for the people involved, the information they pass on is a bargaining game for their own self-preservation, not a rational scientific process. At the bottom of the planning pyramid, the managers of individual state-owned firms would falsely report their firm's production statistics. And they do this to minimize to, to maximize their resource allocation and to minimize their production quota. And in doing this, firm managers were trying to reduce the chances of falling short on plan targets and thus minimize the likelihood that they and their workers would face some kind of punishment. However, the planning bureaucrats at the higher levels of the pyramid also would understood this game. So to compensate, the plan commands that they would issue tended only to increase. So this is called the ratchet effect. And we see incentives for self-preservation on the collective farms as well. So at harvest time, crops produced on the collective farms are usually meant to be handed over to the government who then distribute them. And in exchange, the farm and its workers get a ration of food, consumer goods and fertilizers. However, because the farmers have a strong incentive to protect themselves, their version of falsifying data was to pre-harvest a portion of their crops so that it wouldn't be subject to government seizure at harvest. But the ratchet effect was applied here in agriculture too. So just as in other industries, the planning bureaucrats understood that pre-harvesting goes on and they budget this into their plan commands accordingly. So the resulting information distortions in the planning process ended up having a huge impact. It would create resource bottlenecks throughout the economy because inaccurate data led to distorted planning targets, which over time created essentially unfulfillable production quotas because of this disconnect between the planning commands and the reality that they were trying to manage. And then this would create a positive feedback loop of inefficiency and low output. So in, a, in essence, the dodgy planning process incentivizes inefficient production. When planning targets were continually increased by the bureaucrats on the basis of previous output, if you are a worker or the manager of a firm, why would you place yourself on the chopping block? chopping block by producing at an optimum level when that level would continually increase. And it would also incentivize resource hoarding. So again, if you're a firm manager, why would you make a rod for your own back when you're not sure when the next shipment of raw materials is going to arrive? The overall result was that the command system was enormously wasteful. State-owned firms and collective farms would end up with stuck stockpiles of some supplies, but also have shortages of others. So it was really hard to run your production process uh, with such uneven supplies of the raw materials. Across almost all sectors of the economy, the production targets for any given product almost always exceeded the amount of that product that was actually produced. Supply shortages at any point in the economy would cause production stoppages to ripple across supply chains. Now, of course, supply chain disruption is something that we've become familiar with in Australia during the COVID pandemic. 
But in the North Korean command economy, it's an unintended structural feature of the system itself. If that's a structural vulnerability that's become embedded in the system rather than just a short term aberration, then here we see the seeds of a systemic breakdown. In 1991, an external shock event interacted with these systemic vulnerabilities of the command system to essentially break that system in the DPRK. And that shock event was the collapse of the Soviet Union. So why was the collapse of the USSR so pivotal to the North Korean story? Well, there's a few reasons for that. North Korea was dependent on oil imports from the USSR, which were provided at low friendship prices or as direct aid. But after 1991, these imports stopped and the DPRK didn't really have the ability to purchase oil from the international oil market, which was denominated in US dollars. So the resultant energy shock was calamitous for the North Korean economy essentially de-mechanizing its agricultural sector and bringing industry to a halt almost overnight. North Korea was also dependent on the USSR and dependent on the international communist bloc for other key imports, including fertilizers, foodstuffs, manufactured goods and spare parts, and technical expertise. So without all of these key imports, the already vulnerable command system effectively broke down. This led to another of the 20th century's great calamities for the Korean people, the Great Famine of 1994 to 1998, known in North Korea as the Arduous March. With the economy collapsing and the agricultural sector in disarray, North Korea was plunged into acute food insecurity. Approximately 600,000 North Koreans died of starvation and related illnesses during the Arduous March, and a whole generation of kids were stunted by malnutrition. Food insecurity has plagued North Korea ever since. I'll have more to say about this in my upcoming video on energy crisis, food insecurity, and the arduous march. But I wanna stress that this is a really seminal moment uh, in the evolution of the North Korean state. The existential crisis of the arduous march led to all kinds of unmanaged, crisis survival adaptations by people on the ground outside of the agency of the state. You know, people got to eat. So if you worked on a farm, you could steal some produce from the farm's harvest for yourself and sell some of it on the black market. If you worked in a factory, you could strip away some parts and components from the machinery, which you could use to barter for food. If you worked in a state-run shop, you might steal some products and consumables to sell at these same roadside stalls. If you had relatives overseas, say in China or Japan, they could send you money, send you foreign currency that you could use to buy food and consumables. So remember, foreign currency has value at these roadside stalls because you can buy anything with foreign currency. You can't buy things with the North Korean won. And if they sent you enough money, you might even have enough foreign currency to buy in bulk and on sell for profit and become an entrepreneur. So that's your startup capital. At home, if you had a kitchen garden or a private garden plot, you could grow some food to get by or to barter or trade with. And if you had none of these advantages, you could steal. You could go out into the countryside to harvest wild foods or you could starve. So you can see from that vignette, people worked with whatever they had in their immediate environment to get food directly or through barter and trade. Some people had direct access to food, some people had goods to exchange for food, and some people had foreign currency with which to buy food. So overall, this created the conditions in which entrepreneurialism began to flourish because it was an adaptive process of trade and exchange, which was appropriate for the moment in these conditions. Over time, these coping strategies solidified into something more substantial 
the small-time street entrepreneurs began to congregate in open-air markets. The government tolerated these markets because it relieved some of the pressure on the government to provide food for the people. So this gave the government extra space to divert the state's resources to the military through the Songun system. So one could say the success of the Songun system uh, in cementing Kim Jong-il's power owes itself in part to the separation of the entrepreneurial economy from the control of the state, which is kind of ironic. The first of these government sanctioned indoor markets was the Tongil market in Pyongyang, which you can see on the bottom right. And then others sprang up around the country. So the bottom left picture is from the big market in Rason, which I've visited. It's an absolutely sprawling facility. These markets are called the Jangmadang. And today the Jangmadang are a pivotal element of the North Korean economy. If you've got Chinese yuan or US dollars, you can buy all kinds of consumables at the Jangmadang, from rice to refrigerators. But another reason that the government has come to tolerate the Jangmadang today is based on revenue. So according to my Sydney University colleague, colleague Leonid Petrov, who you're likely to have seen on TV at some stage talking about the DPRK. So according to Petrov, the North Korean government earns between 50 to 70 million US dollars per year just from charging vendors fees. So essentially charging a rent for the people who sell things in the Jangmadang. It's important to stress how pivotal foreign currency is in the story of North Korea's marketization. So the Chinese Yuan is the currency of exchange across most of the North Korean economy today. And one of the reasons is because the entrepreneurs themselves are plugged into the Chinese economy. Much of the food and many of the consumables that you can buy in the Jiangmadang are sourced from China. To conduct trade with Chinese businesses, the North Korean traders have to have Chinese Yuan, which means they need to sell these goods to consumers in the Chinese Yuan. So through this process, the entire marketized economy is now denominated in the UN. In comparison though, the North Korean won is effectively worthless as a currency. And this is problematic for the workers who are still paid in the won, which limits their access to goods and services that are available through the marketized Jiangmadang economy. As it has elsewhere in the world, marketization in North Korea has increased economic inequality and social stratification. The change in the currency of exchange to the yuan has undermined and even inverted the Songbun class hierarchy in North Korea. So because the North Korean won is essentially work, worthless and because workers in the state-owned enterprises are paid in won, that puts them at an economic disadvantage. Now that's ironic because prior to the arduous march, proletarian workers were in a favored economic position in the class hierarchy, but now they're precarious. And also the workers in the state-owned enterprises were predominantly men. Women who'd previously been excluded from many professions while they were kept at home raising families were now available for entrepreneurial activity. And this began as survival coping mechanisms during the arduous march. But now females have become the backbone of the grassroots marketized economy in North Korea. And just as an indicator of this, you can see this reflected in the disproportionately high number of females who are able to flee North Korea as defectors because through entrepreneurial activity, they've put together enough money to bribe border guards to cross into China and to pay people smugglers to move them on to third countries. So that's an interesting proxy indicator of this larger trend that we're seeing. Also, people with foreign relatives were seen as politically suspect prior to the famine and were at the bottom of the class hierarchy, now have become the vanguard of the entrepreneurial class because of their access to foreign currency sources because that gave them the money to survive the arduous march and with money for startup capital for business ventures.
So together, this represents a significant social change and even a political dislocation, which is impacted on the control mechanisms of the authoritarian system. This social change has manifested in the rise of a new middle class in North Korea called the Tonju or money masters. The Donju evolved from the grassroots entrepreneurial activity that arose during the arduous march. It started out as people trading consumable goods in private markets, who then built up enough savings to invest in more substantial business ventures, maybe like a billiard hall or a karaoke room or a small restaurant. And often they had access to foreign currency through relatives or through clandestine cross-border trade with traders in China, which helped them build up relatively high levels of private savings. With middle-class money comes middle-class consumption. And now there's a new market for material pleasures and status markers in the DPRK, particularly in Pyongyang and the larger cities. And you can see this illustrated in the pictures on the slide here. There are associated cultural changes occurring with these evolving consumption tastes. And that's important to the social change story that's manifesting in the DPRK right now. The rise of the Tunju is having undoubted political effects in altering the relationship between the people and the state. But the question is, what direction will these effects go? In 2002 and in, again in 2009, Kim Jong-il devalued the North Korean won in an attempt to wipe out the private savings of the emerging Tonju class to re-establish centralised control over the economy. Now, these currency devaluations did not achieve their intended results, firstly because the Tunju had their private savings in foreign currency, so devaluing the won didn't do anything. But furthermore, it created a hyperinflation for people that were dependent on the North Korean won that made food more expensive and increased food insecurity. So that, and the 2009 devaluation in particular here created a level of public unrest previously not seen in the DPRK. So it's unlikely that the government would try something like this again. This indicates that the size of the Dunju class has reached a level where they're too significant as a group to easily dispose of or to ignore. Liberal theorists in international relations argue that the rise of a middle class in an authoritarian country can lead to greater democratization. Now it's a live question whether the Donju in the DPRK will begin to agitate for political influence to match their economic clout. We need to see what happens, this is an evolving story. An ill-conceived government intervention, like the 2009 currency devaluation, or some kind of external economic shock that threatens their position, this is the type of thing that could precipitate a shifting of allegiances within the political system. So something like an alliance between the Donju and members of the upper members of the Korean People's Army is something to keep an eye out for. For the moment, there's now been an alignment of interest between the government and the Tonju. So some members of this class have amassed a level of wealth where they're in a position to offer joint finance for development projects that the government is struggling to finance on its own. You know, something like building a set of apartments, something of that scale. The major ideological innovation of Kim Jong-un's reign has been the Byungjin Line, which is about mobilising the resources of the North Korean state for simultaneous nuclear weapons development and economic modernisation. The logic of the Byungjin Line is that a mature nuclear weapons capability will provide a security umbrella under which economic reforms can begin to be rolled out, free of external interference. In my video on official ideology in North Korea, I touched on the economic modernization program under Byungjin as encompassing the five M's, markets, mobiles, money, motor cars, and the middle class. In a sense, the five M's represent the government playing catch up to the economic changes that have already taken place since the, since the arduous march. 
and catering to the emergence of the Dunju in particular. The five M's speak to the new tastes and aspirations of the Dunju class, as much as it points to a clear economic strategy. But the more substantive element of Kim Jong-un's economic reform agenda under the Byung-jin line have been North Korea's special economic zones, or SEZs. SEZs are essentially extraterritorial enclaves where foreign companies can partner with local businesses to set up production facilities in order to produce goods for export. Special economic zones were famously championed by Deng Xiaoping in China during the 1980s, which are used to turbocharge China's rapid economic transformation. However, Deng himself borrowed the concept from South Korea, which had developed SEZs through the 1970s and 80s. The SEZ model appeals to the North Korean government for a few reasons. They can obtain foreign capital to develop export-oriented businesses, which create new sources of foreign currency revenue. They can obtain access to new technologies brought in by their foreign business partners. And they can quarantine foreign influence into a limited geographic area, which reduces the chances of ideological pollution for the rest of the population. Now, for example, the Rason Special Economic Zone is one I visited in 2013 and is depicted here in these three photos. Rason is completely fenced off from the rest of North Korea with razor wire and guarded border crossings. It houses numerous factories and processing plants, all financed as joint ventures between Chinese and Russian companies and the North Korean government. It's got new infrastructure links to facilitate the shipping of goods to global markets, including a new port facility and railway links to Russia and China. It's got wind powered renewable energy microgrids to power production facilities, as well as solar powered street lighting. So if you're looking for where the action is in terms of North Korea's economic transformation, it's in the SEZs. The North Korean economy does remain fragile and it's facing some significant headwinds right now. The number one challenge it faces is the government's own approach to the economy, which is now an unsteady hybrid of the remnants of the command system and a marketized proto-capitalism. At the present time, the DPRK is an extremely challenging environment for foreign investment due to its unpredictable legal system, its lack of infrastructure and political uncertainties surrounding denuclearization. The North Korean government has inevitable questions it needs to face. Does it continue to reform the economy and open up, open up to the global market? Or does it attempt to close up shop again and reimpose strict state management of the economy? This question has been faced by all communist countries as they've either transitioned to post-communist societies integrated their economies into the global capitalist system or collapsed. And North Korea is no exception into having to face this question. Now, if they choose to open up further to the global economy, at what pace do they proceed while maintaining political stability? And that's a lesson from the Soviet Union's collapse after reforming and opening too, quick, too quickly. United Nations economic sanctions have also become a significant problem for the North Korean economy. Since 2006, the UN Security Council has passed a series of resolutions which have created successively tighter economic sanctions measures against the DPRK. And you can see these summarized here on the slide. And this is in addition to the bilateral economic sanctions that have been imposed by the US and other states. All of this places significant restrictions on the ability of the DPRK to modernize its economy and to generate foreign currency income. Now, North Korea has become adept at dodging sanctions measures or finding creative ways around them, particularly through illicit trade, shadow banking networks, and now cybercrime. However, the collective weight of the sanctions measures has started to bite. So 
Is the nuclear weapons program worth it for the Kim regime in the face of sanctions restrictions? We have seen calls for sanctions relief become a consistent bargaining point from North Korea in Korean Peninsula nuclear diplomacy since 2016. But nonetheless, it's adamant that it will not denuclearize, regardless of the sanctions measures. Finally, as it has the world over, the COVID-19 pandemic is the latest external shock to impact the North Korean economy. The DPRK government unilaterally closed its borders at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. But in doing so, they severed the economic connections with China that have been the lifeblood of marketization and which have provided the government with a buffer against food insecurity. I'll have more to say on this in my upcoming video on the COVID pandemic in North Korea. So what lessons can we take from the North Korean case that are relevant in other contexts? Well, for one, capitalist societies have their own rituals, incentives and punishments to address the worker productivity problem. So this is about how labor productivity is incentivized in your own workplace. So think about what the similarities and differences are in your workplace to what you've learned here about the North Korean case study. Second, Kim Jong-un's economic reform problem is an extreme example of the conundrum faced by all governments when contemplating structural economic change. Or to put it another, put it another way, at what pace can reforms be implemented without risking significant social and political backlash? And finally, the arduous march illustrates how ordinary people can develop all kinds of creative adaptations to challenging times, which have an ongoing political impact even when the shock event in question has passed. We're seeing something similar right now through the COVID pandemic, which will alter the political economy of countries around the world in ways that we're still yet to see. In your revisions for the assessments, keep these themes in mind. And please don't be afraid to pause this so you can pour over this in more detail.